Well, hey, uh, thanks for the uh, good turnout this morning. When I originally looked at my time slot, I was like, oh, wow, that is crappy. <laughs> you know, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., everybody at DEF CON is going to be at church. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to be pleasantly surprised that you're all here. So um, with that being said, we're going to be talking to you about some research that has really been percolating for about a year within my mind, and then I introduced Mars to it. Um, I've been doing web application security since around 2004. Um, worked with every conceivable application security technology from a black box perspective. And the one thing that I have noticed is that unilaterally, the technology has the same problems that Whisker had, or that the most earliest spider technology had or that the most rudimentary form crawler and fuzzer has. And so there's this common set of underlying weaknesses that have never really been fixed by the development community, by any commercial vendor. And so we've created a methodology and a, and a system for exposing those problems, and it can be used for a variety of ways. And we're going to talk to you about that. Um, the big idea, though, the main overview, is that is there anybody out here who's ever got a headache from a false positive? You've ran some commercial scanner and you've had so many false positives that it find reverse benchmarking is to come up with a system that allows us to begin to expose the flaws and the faults and the mechanics of web application scanning technologies without violating the end user licensing agreements. Those little things that you click through have actually caused a significant amount of grief on the part of researchers because you can't just debug the application. It's against the law, of course, to begin opening it up and exposing its object code or looking at how it does its tests. And it's certainly against the law to discuss these publicly. So what's neat about this methodology is that it's totally legal. You simply use the application in the right kind of situation and those faults will percolate to the top. Now, um, I would mention just before we get off that um, we've started a community initiative and a nonprofit, and uh, we're gonna, it's at reversebenchmarking.org. It's also the Orb Project. And we're also going to be working with Dennis Cruz and with Site Generator to get our reverse benchmarking methodology built into that. All right. Mars, you want to take it away? Um, Mars Luck, um, I've been in. Uh, security since like uh, 99 I think um, yeah I, uh, I've worked for a lot of places um, no place twice um, and now the people I work for don't let me actually say I work for them um, but continuing on with our the rest of our speech um, we're basically that was the introduction by Tom um, and then we're going to talk about just some general concepts in the web application security span scanning space, particularly black boxes. We'll talk about the problem of false positives, which most of the people that got up here are probably somewhat familiar with. Then we'll introduce uh, reverse benchmarking and how that's uh, somewhat different from uh, benchmarking or baselining. Um, and then also just go a little more depth into that. We'll talk about um, 10 of you know common false positive types and then further research um, and then also talk about some of the statistics uh, that we came up with. Um, here's an example of uh, an end-user licensing agreement. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, it says specifically that you cannot uh, disclose how it works. Um, and that's the part that we think is creating a chilling effect. And the fact that there's actually been very little um, research in this and that you know the idea of reverse benchmarking, while some people have certainly thought of it, uh, no one has actually executed on it. Um, I know OWASP uh, with the site generator idea. Um, Dana sent out emails, you know, like 2005, um, you know, starting to scratch on this surface. And it's definitely a problem that's been known since uh, the first of the web application security scanners uh, rolled off the assembly line. I'm going to pass back to Tom for him to talk about his shuriken. Well, I'm going to skip the shuriken, but um, I always read this Sun Tzu quote everywhere I go, so I'm just going to read it here. You know, it's the obligatory Kung Fu Sun Tzu quote. And you know, it's whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. And whoever is second in the field will have to hasten to battle. 
Now, I think when it comes to reverse benchmarking, there's going to be some organizations that are going to be first in the field, and that's really what we want. We really want people to cooperate and to coordinate because we want a community initiative that makes things better. Um, ultimately, though, there, there might be some resistance and some vendors and organizations that give us flack or maybe even try and make what we're doing illegal. And in that case, it's great. I'll just take off my pants and call it the Tom Clause. You know, but at the end of the day, we're going to be pushing on because really, I'm interested in how we assess and improve the quality of security software overall. We look at things like functionality, the ergonomics, how many clicks through the GUI. These are things that people buy a software product for that does security. Feature sets, it's bling, just do you like the way it looks? But ultimately, at the end of the day as users, we have to deal with accuracy and the rates of false positives and that's what reverse benchmarking focuses on as a unit of study. So. Ultimately, there are a few concepts. First off, we're black box technologies are kinds of scanners that you install from one point. You scan and assess remotely. The, the idea of black box is analogy. It's sort of just an opaque barrier because you can't see the inner workings of the piece of software. Um, people do this in a way today, and, and the common technique is a bake-off. Has anybody out there ever had a scanner bake-off or your company or you've just Ran comparisons, okay. Well, a bake-off is sort of the opposite of what reverse benchmarking is. A bake-off is a positive type of benchmarking where you're after a comparison of who, which technology did better or which technology found more and had less noise. Well, reverse benchmarking is a way of making or creating, soliciting false positives and causing massive false positives in any technology where there's a propensity for those things to get out of control. So your goal is not to see who did better, but in a way to see who does the worst. Mars? All right, here's a little uh, graph that we uh, put together to talk about kind of the criteria that um, people have used to talk about vulnerabilities. Um, like in the different type of product lines, uh, vulnerabilities are sometimes uh, understood in different ways. You have the IDS line of thinking, the network security scanner line of thinking, and the web application security line of thinking. But um, in order to kind of frame uh, this uh, talk and the research, um, these are um, you know, just the types of four uh, quadrants uh, that you could possibly have when you're looking for a vulnerability. Um, positive detection uh, would be that you have uh, the scanner finds a real vulnerability um, that is there. The false positive, which we're uh, focused on, is where the vulnerability is not there, and it do in the but the scanner, in fact, finds a vulnerability that isn't there. And so that's the focus. And as things move in the space and web application security scanners uh, become more developed, right, then we can start looking at the higher quality problems, which would be, you know, the face that where there is, in fact, a vulnerability, but they don't detect it, right? But that's the m mystical part of the industry right now that we don't know uh, what we're actually missing. Um, but the way our approach is that we'll first be able to look at what are you know what false positives are there, and once we can get the false positive rates down in the tools, then we'll be able to move on to the higher quality problems of finding more legitimate vulnerabilities. No, that's that's a great point, and it's the massive sense, melt, false sense of security you get from something that yeah. isn't digging into your application. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, that, that's right. There is nobody, and I mean, I this, we wanted to put it there because it is yeah. relevant. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so Dennis just mentioned that there weren't any security technologies that would look at the application and tell you this vulnerability is not present. But rather the technologies that exist are all focused on positive types of detection. 
Whereas the technologies that could exist on the false negative and false positive side could even lean toward the certifying of an application, say, against a particular vulnerability type. I have looked at you with the following criteria and detail, and you do not have this vulnerability. That's a much stronger statement than what is currently being made. But um, ultimately, we want to phase this research into the study of false negatives. But that will be down the line. Um, Check or that would be the ultimate goal of any okay. benchmarking tool is now, to do oh yeah. that. We've, uh, we've spent some time on these slides. I'm going, not necessarily going to pick up the pace, but I am going to say a little bit less. This is just on positive benchmarking. The idea is typically you throw out, a, you figure out what percentage of accuracy did the tools have. Scanner Foodizzle found eight out of 10 vulnerabilities that we know, therefore its accuracy was 80%. Now that is what people typically do with positive benchmarking. And then they, they whip out their numbers and decide what to do on the basis of those numbers. Um, the problem is that this methodology is as, as examined examining or evaluating web application security technologies is limited. There's a lot of factors like this is selection bias. Do you really know what vulnerabilities exist within the sample application you're studying? You might think you do it first and then until you get the, the vulnerability data. At, the within point, at this point, it becomes confusing to people and the, the process just sort of breaks down. There's a, you have to interpret the data. Uh, vendors can tune against a particular application so that you think you've, you think you've uh, found a particular technology that just does stellar against your set. And then you realize, oh, wait, they wrote specific rules for what I was just testing against. Now, this is just a point back that, say, like Site Generator was designed to sort of mitigate the tuning aspect of technologies. And reverse benchmarking is designed to, to go underneath that radar, to make something you can't tune against because we can always create a new fuzz set that triggers your false positives. The best example there would be like WebGoat. Yeah, WebGoat, uh, people tuning against it. Um, so. What is reverse benchmarking? My, it's just designed to kick a scanner's ass, and we're going to trademark that. Um, I think the point, though, is because I work for a technology vendor, I'm not approaching this from my own vendor's standpoint, but that is why I wanted to create a community project, an open project. That way it's out of my hands, because it can't be objective as long as Tom Strasner's doing it. This, when the community does it, as a community, then it becomes an objective methodology. Now, I'll still participate in this organization as a member of my own company, and that's why we would like other participation, but um, that's the idea. Yeah, are there any vendors here? Watchfire, Spy Dynamics, Acunetics? Oh, hey, what's up? Well, it depends on the false positive. Yeah, right? absolutely. But that's a good point. And there's also the idea of semantic differences, right? You can pick an obscure corner case that can cause false positives, but how, how relevant is that or to, say, a production environment? It depends on how you're using the methodology. But there's, there's, we need to work out issues like that. Uh, we're definitely focusing on catching the lowest hanging fruit. Um, right, the stuff that should obviously have been weeded out in some type of QA process. Um, like, in, in the f essence of full disclosure, I used to work as Sensic as well. Um, overlapped a little bit with Tom. Um, so, you know, I know that there's definitely some QA gaps uh, in regard to, you know, the industry in general. And that's our focus is, you know, catching that low hanging fruit. And so we're not, you know, focused on coming up with the obscure corner cases like Tom was talking about, but just doing stuff that is completely wrong. Okay. So once again, just to make everyone on the same page, what we basically, what you do when you want to set up a reverse benchmarking environment, whether you're creating itself, and we'll talk a little bit about how you could create one yourself. But ultimately, you have a web application scanning technology. And then you have a reverse benchmarking target or web application with, with reverse benchmarking capability. There are 
you might think of as trigger signatures and strings and strange architectures. You can imagine, say, a JavaScript road test that's designed to confuse any type of crawling mechanism and make it believe that there are URIs or URLs that don't exist. You can build within this trigger mechanisms that make it believe vulnerabilities would exist. Ultimately, you scan this application and then just get a report. And if you design the application right, the report can even tell you what types of false positives in a taxonomic sense have been discovered. Now obviously that's going to take a lot of research on the part of the community to figure out, well first, what's a good taxonomy for all of the general and generic, say, false positive types. But ultimately you're going to enumerate and then categorize the false positives. It will reveal sort of broken or vacuous signatures. If something has a detection signature that's just 200, then it might be triggered by, it's going to be triggered until the year, you know, 2010. Um, and it, so it, it'll have this false positive for the next three years. Well, something like reverse benchmarking can lay that bare really quickly. Um, it'll reveal s really semantic flaws in categorization, and it will give you the idea if there are any like sort of systemic architectural problems with the technology. When you go through the JavaScript road test type functionality and then into the scanning, you will see where things begin to break down, and you'll see limits in the technology. Mars, you want to talk about the trends um, time-wise? We have, yeah, like it's, we're at 1016. Um, well, I don't really want to belabor this slide. Um, it's just basically the general idea is that applications, web applications, um, since, you know, 99, 2000 have been progressively getting more complex um, and the scanners haven't really uh, stayed pace with it. They've, you know, taken some uh, definitely, um, you know, increases, um, but most of the changes in the scanners have been more GUI focused and how fast they can go through their signature base. But changes in the signature base and the, you know, the technology there um, is uh, you know just not really uh, kept up with the GUI development um, and also the numbers they use to categorize their uh, level. Um, One of my friends who does manual penetration testing was uh, lamenting to me and he says, it's getting harder to do my job every year. I'm having to do more work, not less. And uh, it's just because technology is growing faster than the, than, the, than the technology we use to, say, perform assessments. And that's one of the reasons why an environmental stressor like reverse benchmarking can help improve technology over the long run. Because it's an equal and fair thing that will it allow, also allow the community to help to understand and educate developers. And that way one day when developers are writing new security rules, they'll realize that it's essential to put a no 404 check into a scanner. Right? That a 302 redirect is, should not be considered evidence for a vulnerability. We'll show you some of these false positive types when we get right into them. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Just to give people kind of an idea, like on my day to day, it is a lot at doing black box testing of various web apps uh, for large financial. And it's not uncommon to get, you know, a 5,000 page report um, that, you know, has a significant number of false positives that have to be manually validated. So, I mean, that takes at least, you know, 40 hours of every week just going through that stuff. So that's one of my motivations for doing this is, you know, the self-serving one of, hey, maybe I could work less at some point in the future. Yeah. So I thought we'd warp ahead and look at the actual types of false positives. And these are real examples of false positives that we're not showing who had it or who, whose was it. Uh, but here's a good example of a partial, what we call a partial match problem. Now as we go forward as a community, we can figure out, a, say, different terminology or extra false positive types. But I'm calling this a partial match problem because the detection signature was literally a 200, a 200. So anytime a GET request was issued for .pl back, this 200 was matching the date. And of course it will, it's what we mentioned, it will until the year 2010. Um, and so this is, this is something that would have been found in every assessment report ever run by the technology. And the idea there is, is it's good to know these things because you can weed them out as you're a worker. I mean, if you're using these technologies, it can make your life easier to know what, the, what false positive types exist and you can flag them. Parameter echoing is a big one. And here I've put my, my very elite PHP script. This, you don't get much more elite than this. You didn't see this at Black Hat. Um, but this something simple like this that's just echoing junk into a text area 
will really show you a high degree of the semantic level problems with technologies. And let me give you an idea. There is a, there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability in this script that's echoing it in the text area, and it's if you break out with a, a text area tag. However, you will get thousands, or well, so hundreds of different types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that are bogus. In other words, semantically, the name of the vulnerability may be a double quote, front tick, backslash, cross-site scripting attack works. Well, that's a vacuous result because everything works. The, the delimiters are irrelevant. If you, if, you're, if you encounter a part of the application where the information is being echoed back in a non-executable form, right? And so areas of the application that are just spewing data back can cause false positives because in many cases, one little character that you would need to make it ultimately executable may be missing, or it may be injected into a JavaScript function causing a train wreck, and the data is, is just not relevant. So, Parameter echoing, this will give you just one example. If you were creating your little sample application, sticking something like this in there, and then a page behind it with some um, common strings would give you an example of just how susceptible some of these technologies are. So here's a case of what we call mistaken identity. Now this is a good one because all there's so many open source bulletin boards and forums and blogs that everything has become so in, inbred and um, cobbled together that you can literally get situations where you'll run a security assessment tool and it will come back and the test will be for search.pl, you know, okay, I found this Perl script and it tells you, you know, ah, well this is Alibaba search buffer overflow, but the fact is search.pearl matches hundreds of applications out there, so you don't even know what the result is. Um, you'll also find this on if you're scanning, say, bulletin boards and there's, there's cross-site scripting in a queue comment area. Well, until you inspect the application, you don't know if it's real because there have been hundreds of different applications with this same vulnerability and the name that they're giving you may not even wildly match the technology you're using. So this any time you have issues where just the identity is confused, there's more work for you to do on the back end. And so this is a species of false positive. Um, the other, uh, other problems that we see are just simple ambiguity, right? The, the conditions or the string that's used to detect a thing just doesn't go far enough. And that just because they found, a, say, a SQL error, they're telling you you have full-blown SQL injection vulnerabilities. In other cases, there will be some feature of the application that gets picked out, and the vulnerability just resembles nothing like what is looked for. And so these are issues that that make reporting confusing and, and are, are time consuming. And so there are areas where uh, studying and categorizing those will be helpful. Mars, you wanna? Go ahead. Oh, okay. With response timing, this is a really big section because there's a lot of tests for say SQL injection that use a wait for delay mechanism. Uh, they will just wait for the, they'll, they'll inject a SQL command that will cause the database to count to 100 and then respond back. Well, you can get applications, of course, that are just slow. And so you can see these SQL mechanisms just misfiring like crazy and assigning vulnerabilities to you. So with a revenge, reverse benchmarking target, you can just create a portion of the application that is slow and, and, and make the timing different or gradable and see how many SQL errors just pop up. Th this works with blind SQL injection as well. Or just use portable web app and get that functionality for free. Yeah. <laughs> Now with a uh, custom 404, this should be ancient. This goes back to the, the, the very first scanners of 1998 and 99 written in Perl and put up on root shell. I mean, the, the problem is if you do not check for a 404 message that's clean, if you are simply keying off of the presence of a 200 OK as a status message, as evidence that the vulnerability exists, then if a web application has set up a custom 404 page where anytime you search for something in the URL, you look for a resource, it's not there, you get redirected to a friendly page that says, hi, file not found. But the underlying status codes are usually a 302 followed by a 200 OK. This causes scanners that don't have this mechanism to go nuts. Now that may seem so old. You're like, no, there's no technology in the world that would still do that today. Well, there is in fact commercial technologies on the market today that perform their file scanning without these mechanisms. And there, there's a cause of rampant false positives. We're going to look at some real data here shortly. 
Um, why don't we segue over into that, Marcy? So you can talk about the data segment. Well, just as an introduction, um, we called the, or Tom called um, the application he originally wrote uh, back at you. Um, basically, um, set up that application. It had a number of tests, uh, some of which we've covered. Um, the slide deck will also be up on the reversebenchmarking.org uh, probably later this week after we get back to our respective uh, home bases. Um, we took four popular black box uh, web application scanners, ran them against the target with their default policies and to get these results. Um, I took the results and put them into high level buckets. Uh, some of the high level buckets and stuff like that are fairly arbitrary, but um, you know we're not specifically saying which scanners did this or did that uh, and we're not giving out any of that data so no one should be really concerned. Um, this is just the total false positives uh, for the four different scanners um, as a percentage uh, of a whole. So you can see one of them did really badly. Um, and then the other ones are somewhat similar. Um, so there has been some uh, changes um, in the community and some of the products are um, at a higher state of development as you can see. Yeah, just to point that back out, this slide just shows of the total number of false positives we generated, 92% of them were generated by one of the commercial technologies. Uh, now one of the reasons why this is such a dis you know, disparate amount was that it, it did not have a 404 check, so it found five to 6,000 files that just didn't exist. Just said every backup file in the world and every way you could possibly rename them is in your CGI bin. Now, if you take that data out, they, they're all sort of doing equally badly, right? And so this isn't meant to say that there are three technologies that are stellar and one that's just awful, but really one just had a very, very noisy problem. That well, even should. controlling for that, it would still have yeah. uh, had considerably more. Yeah. Okay, here's a uh, scanner one, false sure positives. The percentages. Um, all right, if you look, uh, the different categories I just put in is path manipulation. It had some type of uh, path traversal or path disclosure types of false positives. There was command injection, Windows, Unix. Um, probably a lot of people are familiar with that. And then there was all uh, of uh, the scanners had cross-site scripting um, false positives, which that was just simply putting a script, a JavaScript, with cross-site scripting, uh, or XSS, uh, in just a blank page, and they all triggered on that. Yeah. One thing I would add that is interesting, and I would, and this shows that there is some, that there is, there's, there's improvement going on, is that you would, you might think that false, that say cross-site scripting would be the most prevalent vulnerability if you had, say, a, an echo mechanism like our little elite PHP script. But in fact, in this application, it was only 7%. And the other characteristics, we actually had SQL injection false positives we could generate upwards to, it was just 2%. But with command injection and path manipulation, that was combined 72% of the results. And so that shows you areas of security testing where if you were to tighten the testing procedures, implement mechanisms that say, will during a crawl look for the presence of the strings that you are going to use on the basis of detection and then rule those out as sort of a pre-qualifying run? Well, technology improves. No one's doing that yet. This just shows you how reverse benchmarking could open doors to actually to, to inspire people to, to, to code differently. Um, with the SQL injection, those are basically strings from SQL you know, servers um, that just were in text areas in a static HTML page. Um, so um, that's what generated those. Uh, the file disclosure was any type of file, mostly the 404 types of problems Tom was talking about to where it thought it found a vulnerable file um, that it didn't. Um, the known vulnerabilities, that categorization was basically any of the semantic um, types of mistaken identity where it said, you know, uh, Emily Forums 1.0 had, you know, a vulnerability in you know, PHP blah or whatever. Um, and then misconfigurations were uh, mostly uh, things like to do with the web servers or something like that. Um, with Scanner 2, um, you can see that the majority of uh, the false positives there with path manipulation. Um, and then also, interestingly, uh, the file disclosure as well. So as you can see, there's a dispersion of the problems uh, that are kind of you know, across uh, the various scanners that they each have kind of you know, signatures uh, that can be 
fooled uh, fairly easy um, with very simple um, problems, uh, low-hanging fruit, as we were talking about. Um, scanner 3, uh, the bulk of them uh, were actually um, misconfigurations. Um, and things that it thought about a web server or a web version or a version of you know uh, some type of scripting software or something like that that actually uh, wasn't there. Um, and then file disclosure was also a problem um, with these. Scanner 4 um, also uh, had the same uh, problem as Scanner 3. Um, I mean, these are just trying to give you an idea. The main takeaway here is just that each of them uh, still have, you know, most of these, uh, though some of them, you know, have less functionality and don't necessarily uh, even test for some of these. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Kind of yeah. <laughs> uh, Scanner 4 had um, a big problem with SQL injection as well. Its uh, SQL injection technology was just pattern matching. And so the fact that these SQL error strings were in the HTML uh, messed with it more than some of the other ones. Um, that's kind of just the. Uh, how much time? We're we going to let up. We can let them download that from the web, right? Off. Yeah, we're going to put these slides up, and I mean, you can draw whatever conclusion you want. This is this talk is mostly about um, getting this idea out and trying to get some community community support and get people to start submitting false positive scenarios and false positive types to where you know um, we can have a you know a bigger uh, set of tests and come up with better ro uh, road testing uh, applications um, and kind of get, we've also talked about having a taxonomy of false positives because until we truly understand like false positives in a more robust scientific sense, I think uh, engineers are going to have a hard time understanding that and this is going to, can, or the web application of security space is still going to continue to be more of an art than a science. And so putting some rigor around that is also um, some of what we're looking to do. Um, for further research, uh, we want to improve the reverse benchmarking target, add more tests, like I said, improve the testing methodology, um, because right now the, the, there's so many different signatures that are um, kind of you know thrown out by the application scanners that coming up with the buckets uh, is somewhat arbitrary, and you know I did that late last night, so um, it's far from perfect. And then there's also um, I would also mention that there's a sort of a dual level here because. Dealing with the, with the application spider and what causes the spider to enter erroneous states, get hung in infinite loops, or even find things that don't exist is really key. For instance, if you just take um, an HTML page that looks exactly like a directory listing, you can find out which of the spiders will begin following the links on that page, thinking that they're entering new directories when they're just following HTML links that just double back onto itself. Um, you can create strange architectures that will, that will expose the faults in spiders. And so when the vulnerability scanning develops sort of a, a side that is specific to kind of road testing and generating false positives in spiders is good. And Site Generator has aspects of this because you can dynamically generate pages in JavaScript and Flash. And so I think that there'll be more room for fruit, fruitful interaction there. I mean, um, well, where are we at? Okay. All right. That's strange. I thought I had 10 more pages to go. <laughs> While Tom uh, uh, puts that back up there, um, just to clarify, the testing target that we used and the testing that we did uh, didn't include any of the type of spider evaluations. Um, so that's one of the other areas uh, to where uh, you know focus is needed. And like Tom said, site generator. So we also just want Consumers, to, consumers of these products to be more educated and be able to make decisions based, um, you know, on how accurate um, and how robust um, the web application scanner is, as opposed to, you know, the marketing GUI. Hey, um, Mars, tell him I'm going to pull up the sample app and uh, I'll show you. I'll show him just some okay, of he's uh, since we have a few minutes more, um, going to pull up the sample app um, and uh, show some of the tests. Okay, and we'll also take questions. Is it, 
It is not. With attribution, I mean, we think it's legal because there's no specific attribution. Dean screws everybody. <laughs> I was just asking: is is it legal to actually disclose, you know, on the Euler, right? Is actually to disclose information of what they're not finding. So because it, that, it'd be an interesting loophole, right? Because if the the Euler doesn't say you can't disclose what we don't find, or you can't, but they they say we can't disclose the results, right? So it's it's will be covered by there. Although from, from the OAS, well, what we will ask actually officially is that we will ask each of the vendors to, um, to actually give us a license. And we were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago. And I think what we'll do is we'll give the vendors one chance to comment on the results, just in case you, know, you get something really wrong. So you do the thing, you send the vendors that, hey, we found this using, you know, these are the results we have. Is anything we missed pretty stupidly? And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, you run the thing again and you publish the results. And we hope there's no vendor which is stupid enough to actually try to tune their, their tool to actually match the patterns, because that would be a big problem. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, anyone else uh, have a oh. question? Or are you ready, Tom? Yeah, actually, I uh, want to just say a few things about kind of the junk that we put in the, uh, the sample app. Um, first off, just having an area which echoes back, say, things that look like a directory listing, things that look like the output of netstat minus an, um, of course, your default boot I and I, where you'll, you'll have your obligatory bootloader. Uh, then some dates and uh, directories. Then you have things like uh, you know Unix or Linux ID command, where you know it just you you on the roof the page following the form it tells you you your UID zero. Um, and so it's things like this that get put into the application that cause trouble for the mechanisms. And it's once we begin to adapt and develop more sophisticated text testing procedures, then it's where these methodologies actually improve technology ongoing, right? And so even if disclosure never happens or even if there isn't a showdown, it's not our goal to make anyone look bad, but it is our goal to expose false positives in a way that help the community think of understand the problem better, understand a taxonomy of false positive types, help developers when they're writing code go, ooh, I need to avoid these 10 things, and ultimately make the technology better for everyone. Now, with OWASP and Dennis, there, we may be doing some participating in some events and things like this, but the ultimate goal of our methodology is research-oriented and to help an understanding of false positives and to get people from all organizations to contribute so that we can um, understand the problem better, right? No, and, and the questions? Yeah. Um, no, it's not available right now. Um, it's a little too ghetto to get about, give out. That's my um, my attitude of it. But yeah, we're going to yeah. work with Site Generator to come up with some tests, and we've thought of coming up with maybe like a top ten kind of false positive categories, and then categorize different tests that test for those. Um, which Tom, uh, you want to go back to the like top. The ten different uh, false positive types that we kind of rush through. Yeah. Oh, did you take that slide out? No. Just so I can it's on. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah. Here, I'll walk out. Okay, uh, not going to work. <laughs> the cord has length, but... Um, <laughs> Most scanners today have uh, a configuration Um, yeah, there's definitely the custom 404 error pages that the different vendors have developed. And with custom configuration, when you know your applications, you can certainly weed some of that out. Um, in fairness to all the vendors and to have a baseline, we didn't, conf we didn't change anything from the vendor's defaults, right? Because if we were wh whittling around with all the various settings, we could have biased, you know, or at least in our under in the way our thinking was just use everybody's default policies and default scan uh, against the same target, and that would be the closest to, you know, 
Right. Um, and it's a pure my, kind of test. Uh, let me answer in on this, too. Also, we weren't trying to do any official benchmark or showdown, and we don't put any stock in our numbers. That's why we, we didn't really even we didn't tell you who was who. Our goal in getting the results that we did was just to show you that if you take existing technologies and do what we are talking about here to them, you get useful or interesting results. And then those are results that other people can do showdowns or comparisons with. Right. Well, actually, that's quite interesting because you should actually be publishing the two, the two sets of data. You should be publishing the data that says this is out of the box, and then you should publish the data that says this is when you personalization. And actually, the amount of work that you need to go from one to make to B is also very significant. Because at the end of right. the day, right, if, if, one, if there's a lot of custom script, you probably script the whole thing, right? You but go. you have to write all of that, right, to get those results. And clearly, that's right. You know, and see, that's where we would, that's where working with you would be a big help because. Um, uh, reversebenchmarking.org doesn't plan to get into the business of comparing or publishing comparisons officially, but we would work with you and OWASP carry that out. Yeah, ultimately users tend to, you know, like in the marketing literature, you're, how many clicks to the user can set this off. So I don't think many of those custom, you know, configurations are actually really used by you know, the vast majority of users of the products. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, okay, well, um, there is an alternative opinion. I usually call them the big button, like the CSSP guys, right? Because the CSSP guys are just going to press the button, and then grab the five-page report and go to somebody. So you're saying the majority of the users of the products are actually very skilled, as opposed to the user base is not very skilled, or...? Well, that was the easiest way to do the testing, right? Yeah, having some idea of, sorry to cut you off, um, having some idea of where hours are spent by people and where, you know, how much time is spent and stuff like that is definitely, I think, useful. And maybe some academic would like to explore that, you know, working with the vendor and having some type of, you know, pool of users. And you can have a control set that were, you know, the clickies um, and no zero configuration kind of pool as opposed to, you know, expert power user type of pool and, you know, do the evaluation across those. But I think that the precondition for that would be some type of reverse benchmarking or benchmarking app, you know, like Site Generator that can't really be, um, you know, um, ahead of time. The scanners can't be configured to, you know, go one for one against its tests. Having some dynamic generation, having both positive benchmarking and the reverse benchmarking types of tests. So, yeah, this talk is just to get kind of the ball rolling and getting people thinking about this kind of stuff because ultimately, you know, I think there's a lot of time wasted. I, you know, I know from personal experience, a lot of time going through false positives, even with the various types of tuning, using, you know, multiple different uh, scanners. Um, it, it's still there's a high rate of false positive. It, I mean, it depends on a lot of things. There's a lot of different variables that we can't necessarily control for, you know, right now, and might still be very hard to control for in the future, especially with the pace of web application, you know, technology and development as web services come on, AJAX and stuff like that. Um, just the complexity is going up, and you know, so. Also, well, yeah, the question in the front. Third party in this point. And their 
reports are based on the weight, which is ridiculous. They'll just go through and send you a scan of your network and fix something 300 times and send it to me as a report. Yeah. And you have to actually go through that crap to yeah. what's there. You have to pay them because of the regulatory requirements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, um, we're going to be in the. We'll be going to the breakout room after this. If you have more questions or you want to sit around and uh, uh, chat, uh, we'll be heading over there after the talk. But yeah, it's a, that's a good point. Yeah, definitely there are, you know, different classes of users, and the audit kind of function or compliance kind of function uh, uses these tools as well. Enterprise technologies will also capitulate this cycle. Uh, generally, if it, depending on who did the configuration or how many servers are being scanned, there's generally you know not a not a lot of opportunity to insert yourself into a process and uh, make changes. So it just depends on the functionality that's present. But you can easily find false positives being more more of a problem in situations where you either have the technology being configured by a team and then ran over your whole network where they're not looking at each segment and or each specific server looking over the reports. Well, there, there's certainly, even if there's no motivation um, and the people have the appropriate skill set, um, there is still just the fact that this takes a lot of time to do and if you don't know the application when you hit the ground running and you're scanning something you don't know you're going to take multiple days just figuring out how the application works and there's still the case that you know manual testing um, manual pen testing of a web application is more effective than any of the scanners um, there you know so I've no one's published the you know specific real results in that regard I've seen either, um, but that's kind of you know one of the big uh, you know things in the industry that no one really talks about is that uh, an educated you know skilled security consultant is still going is still more bang for your buck um, than you know people running just commercial tools. But there's the time function of things that you only have two weeks to do something or three weeks to do something like you can't, you you know there's. There's costs associated with it. Um, and if we can get the cost of a false positive down, or the number of the false positives down, then people will be able to focus on other types of problems um, and ultimately be more effective. And the third party, third party you know, you can potentially get you know, more effective results from them and more bang for the buck. Um, because using commercial tools is a necessity, um, you know, at least in the, the world I live in. There's no other way to do them. It just doesn't scale doing all manual testing. And using the combination of the two uh, is certainly, you know, the way I approach work is I generally use commercial tools to do a first pass kind of, you know, benchmarking. And then I go through and go through the false positives and stuff like that and catch the low hanging fruit with the commercial scanners and then come back given time and look for more advanced things, you know, with just a proxy and, you know, raw tools and stuff like that. Um, because we generally don't ever have time or, uh, or we give in source code. So we do everything black box. Um, and that's certainly more, you know, I think it's in some ways challenging, more challenging than some of the others, but it doesn't require the level of knowledge that, you know, some of the other source code analysis and stuff like that. So in general, kind of the assessment industry um, is going to have to come up with ways to deal with this because all the commercial tools, uh, black box, gray box, white box, however you call them, um, are still not as good as a human. Um, and which is good for us, right? We get paid to do it. Um, but having more effective tools where the humans can spend less time, you know, fighting the tools instead of fighting, you know, vulnerabilities or whatever um, is what we're looking for. So thanks, everybody. Right. Yeah, thanks, everyone.